this will be the story of the millennium. And it was a beautiful fall evening. It was dark but clear. I noticed a couple of lights in the sky. Sightings were extant from Metro Halifax to the southwestern tip of Nova Scotia. I've seen this object. Look, what the hell is that? We didn't know what was happening. I had to make sense of it, and I certainly had to make it known. Because you couldn't believe what I'm seeing through my binoculars. Everybody knew what had happened that night, and we're held to secrets. I don't know, it just isn't, uh, just isn't incredible. We, we lose sight of it at the bottom of the hill, and we get to the top of the hill, it's in the water. I don't know what that thing is down there, but it's no submarine. And it was very disturbing. Very eerie, very eerie. It is the most highly classified subject in the United States government. Something came out of the sky and went into the water in Chang Harbor, and nobody knew what it was. I mean, I definitely knew what I saw. I haven't seen anything like it, not ever since, or before. This case does not evaporate. There were many strange lights in the sky over Nova Scotia that night. But for the people of Shag Harbor, those lights would fall to the earth. And the eyes of the world would fall on Shag Harbor. And this case could be the one. A genuine UFO experience transcends the individual, it transcends the culture, and it defies interpretation and application of the scientific method. It changes us in some fundamental sense. And once we have the type of proof that will stand up to the skeptic, this will be the story of the millennium. He's a bulldog. He goes at it, which is what you have to do to do a good job on a particular case. It takes time, it takes money, it takes dedication. And so Chris's work has made Shag Harbor into a meaningful case. And this case could be the one. On October the 4th, 1967, the night of the UFOs, Chris Stiles was 12 years old. He was one of dozens who saw strange lights in the sky over Nova Scotia that night. That experience formed a lasting impression. Back on the uh, night of October 4th there, after leaving the front door of the house and racing down through the uh, adjacent streets at breakneck speed, around to the corner there of the nearby warehouse and made my way over the tracks here to get a, a vantage point to see what was moving along the harbor. I remember standing there utterly terrified. I had the sense that I wasn't supposed to be here. I wasn't to be this close. And this huge orange sphere was simply tracing the shoreline a ways out, uh, coming directly toward me. I, I kind of felt as if it would be like a dog when you run from it, it would suddenly pounce on you. I literally felt cold inside. I can remember it was one of the few times in my life I felt real fear and you know the difference. It's like when people discuss the difference between hunger and sugar hunger, something that few people in North America truly know. The next morning, Chris received a long-distance phone call from his grandfather in Shag Harbor, 150 miles down the coast. His grandfather told him that he too saw lights in the sky last night, and that one of those lights had crashed into the waters of Shag Harbor. I think the Shag Harbor incident is very important because it's one of the very few cases where we have some really good indication that Something came down close to military systems, was seen by people. And it hasn't yet brought forth the knives from the noisy, nasty negativists that Roswell has, for example. Well, this is certainly the spot. Yeah. Few little changes around here. See, they slapped a coat of paint on the building. Years yeah. later, Chris saw a television program about the Roswell, New Mexico UFO crash of 1947. It reminded him of Shag Harbor. 
From that moment, Shag Harbor became an obsession with him. The Shag Harbor incident is uh, unique in that it's one of the cases that the more data you learn, the more witnesses, the more documentation, this case does not evaporate. The more you learn, the stronger it gets in terms of its unconventional reality. One of the first witnesses Chris talked to was a fisherman named Laurie Wickens. We was driving up through Shag Harbor, headed toward Woods Harbor, taking the girls home that were with us. On the night of the UFOs, young Wickens and some of his friends were driving home from a dance. We happened to look off to our right. I think I noticed them first and see some lights flashing in the sky. One would be on, then another one and another one, and the four would be on, and they'd all go off, and that sequence would start over. We thought it was an airplane, although the, the lights were different than any planes that we had seen, but I still think it was an airplane at the height and stuff, and the speed it was flying. The strange flashing lights followed the car along the highway for some time. Wickens thought the plane was in trouble. It's flying this way, tips that way, and but we're coming into a hill, so we can't... We, we lose sight of it at the bottom of the hill, and when we get to the top of the hill, it's in the water. And we figured it was a plane crash, so we went to the nearest phone booth and called the RCMP. Lori Wickens was the uh, first person to report uh, the incident to the RCMP detachment. The officers wasted no time getting to the scene of the crash, near an Irish moss plant overlooking the harbor. When officers first drove into the parking lot of the plant, there was already a crowd of locals gathering that were trying to figure out what was going on out on the waters of the sound. What they saw when they got there was a pale yellow light that appeared to be as much as eight feet above the surface of the water, and it was moving under its own power. It was moving in the direction of the uh, ebbing tide, but it seemed to be moving at a greater rate than that, and it was trailing a wide path of yellow foam. just looked like a yellow globe. That's all we could see. While we was watching it, there was three RCMP officers, myself, and I do not know who else was there that watched it just disappear. It disappeared different than anything I ever see. You couldn't, it didn't look like it sank, it didn't look like it went out, I don't know, it just disappeared. Everybody still figured it was an airplane, the light of a plane. We all did, even the RCMP. They're all thinking that there's people out there either dead or dying, bodies maybe floating around in the water. That's what they're thinking. Nobody's thinking UFO at this point. Whenever there was trouble in the water, the RCMP relied on local fishermen for help. Lawrence Smith was on his way to bed when he received an urgent phone call. He said, uh... I think we've got a plane down the sound. You know, I said, oh my God, a plane. First thing I thought of was people in the water. We got out by the Marco boys and up through the rocks and out by the Prospect Point Wharf. And then we opened her up full speed. Smith and his crew were the first to get underway. Soon, other fishermen raced to the scene, joining Smith in the search. When we got there, there was no light. No people in the water where we thought there would be from a plane crash, and all we found was foam. Instead of wreckage, rescuers encountered a peculiar patch of foam that stretched for over half a mile in length. And it was very disturbing. Uh, there was a little smell like sulfur, burnt sulfur. Several local fishermen who witnessed the foam felt most strongly that this was not normal tidal foam. Besides the fact that they're uh, acquainted with the local conditions, I mean, there were several key features that just uh, made it just stand apart. The sparkle, the way it dissipated, uh, the sheer amount of it and the density of it uh, implied something quite unusual. I have been fishing that area for 45 years. I, I have never seen any foam like that ever on the water. And if you, were, if you were motoring out through going fishing and you went through something like that, you would, you would stop and say, what's been going on here? Go. 
As the fishermen searched the harbor, the RCMP contacted the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax. The RCC put out an urgent call to military and civilian sources, asking for reports of any missing aircraft along the eastern seaboard, from Labrador to Cape Hatteras. Coast Guard Cutter 101 from nearby Clarks Harbor was immediately dispatched to Shag Harbor to aid in the search effort. It was so quiet and clear and uh, the tr sound travels over water that night that they could hear the twin diesel engines starting up 13 miles away in, in Clarks Harbor. And then it raced over probably about eight to 10 knots to get over to the area. By the time 101 reached the area from the nearby life saving station, the foam had dispersed but uh, the boats were still plying their lights on the water and looking for any clue as to what may have struck the water surface. Again, concern ran high for the possibility of survivors. An hour later, the word was coming back from RCC in Halifax that nothing was missing. There was no military aircraft missing, no commercial aircraft missing, no private aircraft that were on flight plans were missing. So everybody at this point is wondering, well, what are we looking for? There's nothing up there. We have nothing. Something came out of the sky and went into the water at Shag Harbor, and nobody knew what it was. Nobody seemed to know what it was that crashed in Shag Harbor that cold October night. But everyone agreed something had gone into the water and could still be resting there. Perhaps something worth looking for. Shag Harbor was making waves in the media, too. Newspapers, tabloids, and even a comic book jumped on a sensational headline story written by Chronicle Herald reporter Ray McLeod. It was not his usual sort of assignment. We had reports of lights going down into the water, and the RCMP were telling us that their people had seen it, various people in the boats had gone out, and I was on the phone getting everyone I could to talk to me and gradually started piecing together what had been seen that night. A contact I had in the armed forces gave me a number to call in Ottawa for a squadron leader, Bain, who tells me that he was heading a Canadian Armed Forces unit that basically investigated and cataloged UFOs, as almost like the American Project Blue Book, which I had never heard of and didn't know existed. He said, yeah, this sounds like an incident that may have something concrete in it, which they made into a headline for the paper. In my judgment, it became a headline story because we had RCMP officers who not only saw it, but were making public statements and they saw it. McLeod's hunch as a reporter warned him that this official candor was too good to be true. One of the strange things was that at that time, the RCMP was totally cooperative because they were not sure what had happened and what had gone down. And as the story progressed, we started to get less and less from the official source of the RCMP and more and more from just the, you know, the ordinary people in the area who had seen, seen something happen and had gone out in their boats to investigate it. As officials intensified their search and prepared for an immediate dive, the locals began to pressure the RCMP for some answers. I asked him if he found out anything about the plane yet, and he said they've identified it as a UFO. I asked him what he was talking about, more or less, and he wouldn't say no more than that. That's all he would say. On October the 7th, two days after the crash, Navy divers from HMCS Granby started searching the bottom of Shag Harbor for wreckage. But what this wreckage might be remained unspecified. The waters off Shag Harbor are shallow and the currents are strong. The Navy divers knew if the wreckage had not been swept out to sea, they would soon find it. Now, as it turned out, they stayed on the dive until Sunday night, um, so that they'd done two and a half days on the dive before they packed up and uh, took whatever they had into a, a, an old deuce and a half uh, army vehicle they called Old Sid. They come in around noontime. They had a package that which they brought in and put in the Navy diver's van, and they left, and they 
that was the end of all the diving. Residents of Shag Harbor claim they watched as the military hauled something out of the harbor. When they quizzed the divers about what this was, the divers simply responded by claiming that these things were markers they used on the bottom to keep their orientation. It's hard to imagine that you would have uh, markers that are, would have in their description constituted a hazard when you're under the water. They were simply quite jagged, twisted, etc. Um, it just doesn't line up. Strangely enough, if you, well, if you go by the military documents, the, the divers found nil. That's uh, not a bit of anything. Nothing in the water. I'm looking forward to having a look at that slide. Uh, yeah, Robert. I am uh, too, because I haven't seen it for quite some time, and it'd be nice to look at it again. So sure. After you. Thank you. No one has ever learned what the Navy pulled out of Shag Harbor that week of 1967. Local investigators would have to look elsewhere for clues to the origin of the crashed object. One such clue may come from the night of the UFOs itself. Photographer Wilfred Eisner was yet another witness to the strange lights in the sky. They were there for a reason, there's no doubt about that. And there were more people that seen him than myself. Eisner and two of his friends were burning an old boat on Mason's Beach, east of Shag Harbor. On one of these uh, times when I went for driftwood, I noticed uh, a couple of lights in the sky. I thought it was kind of curious. And I thought, well, better take a picture of them. He had planned to take photos of his boat for posterity. But instead, he captured what may be the only existing photograph of the UFOs. Well, that's it, right above where them people are. The five-minute time exposure he took that night yields interesting details about the nature of the objects. First time I saw this uh, slide, I was really impressed with the detail on it. Uh, maybe you can explain uh the streaks and the, uh, the, the colored lights in the, in the middle of the picture itself? Well, the streaks, Don, were made, uh, as you can see, by the stars, and that would be the length of the exposure, because the Earth is moving. And these three lights are obviously stationary, and they have left no streaks whatsoever. The third light uh, would have appeared to me, I would presume, at this point in time, as a star. Right, yeah. You see. Yeah. Did but the then other... they, they, it left no streak, so it was a stationary object for that duration of the exposure. It's not a helicopter or any such object. The helicopter couldn't hover in position like that and not, stay that no way, way for five or no. seven minutes without moving and, uh, and blurring the image. It's, it's quite incredible. Yeah. Well, Chris Stahl and I um, figure this photograph is significant in the, f in the fact that it took place about an hour before the Shag Harbor incident. We're not uh, claiming that this is the object that went into Shag Harbor. I don't really believe it was. It's just another one of the objects that was seen that night, but it is a UFO, and it's quite spectacular looking, and uh, we'd like to know what it is or what shows up behind those lights. Canadian Defense Department investigates UFO that dived in the Nova Scotia Bay. Early in the investigation, Chris Stiles joined forces with Don Ledger, who had his own sighting on the night of the UFOs. Don brought a pragmatic approach to uh, the UFO investigations. He had called me, uh, hearing of some of my exploits on UFO matters. He became very interested, and we decided to combine forces to uh, try to shed some light upon that case and the UFO phenomena. The Shag Harbor incident seems to be the UFO story that never ends. It seems the more you investigate the Shag Harbor story, the more detail you get. It never seems to dry up. There's always another detail that comes out, another witness that comes forward. It's a highly anomalous uh, incident that took place in 1967 and uh, seems to continue and continue and continue, and it still continues. But what of the official investigation of Shag Harbor? If the military and police were calling the objects UFOs, would their official documents provide more details? Chris hoped to find that answer through the National Archives of Canada. 
He was not surprised when he learned the military had a keen interest in Shag Harbor. Records Group 77 is a hodgepodge of UFO reports from civilian, military, and police sources. It gives a whole cross-section of Canadian UFO reports. And what they are mostly is, is a record that was compiled and sorted through and preserved by the National Research Council. RG-77 contains over 7,000 UFO documents dating back to 1947. I knew that there was a microfilm record in Ottawa of UFO documents. Uh, I'd heard it mentioned by other researchers. I tried to read up on as much literature as possible. And I just requested anything and everything they had from that period in the hope that something would have a bearing on Shag Harbor. And indeed, we did strike pay dirt in RG-77. The pay dirt came in the form of official telexes between Ottawa and Nova Scotia. There are a number of documents, a number of telexes that went between the bases and the DND record that show that they thought they were dealing with a real UFO incident. Some of the officers wrote on these documents which have been preserved on microfilm. And perhaps what's even more telling is the margin notes. We have three letters scrawled at the top, UFO, and underlined three times. I've looked at thousands of documents from various UFO incidents, and that's the only case where I've ever seen this reaction. I've often said, I don't know if what's responsible here is extraterrestrial, extratemporal, or extradimensional, but it was certainly unconventional. And uh, I think they ran with that premise in Ottawa, and I think that the priority and the tone of these documents speaks loudly that they were dealing with something potentially extraterrestrial. Canadian Forces Station Barrington lies 13 miles from Shag Harbor. This NORAD radar station provided aerial detection during the height of the Cold War. Chris and Don wanted to know what role it played in Shag Harbor. I think we would have been very concerned. What is it? Whose is it? What are its intentions? Did the various and sundry sensing systems in the area detect anything? Where is that thing? What's it doing? And do we have any good, solid information on it? So what I'm saying is you have to look at this from a strictly military viewpoint. Defense, what's going on? What can we do about it? That's a very important consideration in today's world. I mean, if this is a, truly is a vehicle or vehicles from uh, other planets, then finding out their method of propulsion, finding out what they're made of, uh, finding out how they work, would give tremendous uh, military advantage to the nation that, that uncovered that information. That would be very hot military data, partly because it may tell you where you're vulnerable. Did this radar site detect the Shag Harbor UFO? Uh, this is still active. It's uh, uh, There's a landline running out of here somewhere, and it's uh, feeding Greenwood for rest Western approach, and I think they're using the Halifax to probably link through to Moncton Center or New Brunswick. It's all automated, of course. Oh, it's all automated, yeah. yeah, but it's still working. Yeah. And uh, You can certainly see why they picked the site for the well, base. Traffic's you know, just, constantly going through here yeah. uh, all day long. It's up there now, probably. You just can't see it. If there was something over there, this thing had to have it on it. Yeah. Unless, of course, like a lot of UFO reports, they don't pick them up on radar, but apparently they did. But then again, Coming the in civilian... over Siberia, they had it. They had it over northwestern Canada and Alaska well, and so on. You look at Mercy's RCMP report, he had returns at his sighting up at Sambro. What? Yeah. And Two hours to half an hour before the deck of radar. Yeah. And they had visual sightings too, you know. And one of those objects was seen to surface and arc toward southwestern Nova Scotia, so... Yet these boys saw nothing. Not yeah, a thing. they saw nothing. The radar, I don't know. It just isn't. Uh, just is incredible. Let's take a look up here. But at the end of it, it's interesting that the military still stated that they believed that something had indeed gone into the water and that it had been unconventional. They just didn't find it. Uh, it's kind of different from the other ufological stories. Not only in that no one reported a UFO, but in this case, this is the one that got away. Or did it? get away. People forget rule number one for security. You can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. So you have to deny your own people 
the history of the Manhattan Project. When the first atom bomb was tested, July 16th, 1945, rather successfully out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, Trinity site, people saw it 100 miles away, even though it was 5.30 in the morning. So a press story went out, an ammunition dump had blown up, and fortunately nobody was injured. That appeared in a number of papers in New Mexico. I had to say something. They were lying through their teeth, but of course they were, and they should. Whether you're looking for a crash sauce or a downed Soviet piece of hardware from space or a downed American piece of hardware from space, it's all the same problem. How to mobilize people, how to package, ship, where do you do it, how do you keep other people away? A former staff member of the Barrington Radar Station breaks this military code of silence. It had involved a lot of people. It was a big event. And they had thought that it was something out of the normal. And everybody inside that room knew what had happened that night and were held to secrets. He was briefed by his commanding officer about what the radar actually detected that night. He had seemed to think that it had entered the airspace somewhere in northwestern Canada and it sort of wobbled through the atmosphere until it linked into Atlantic Canada. That it almost hit an airplane somewhere outside of Quebec and that it had crash landed in Shag Harbor. That there was another one tending it and that after the event, they both had moved. Did the military know that there were, in fact, two UFOs in Shag Harbor and that they'd left the impact site submerged, coming to rest off the coast near a top secret military base 30 miles away? I think that perhaps if there is evasion and if perhaps there's a coordinated cover up, then somebody somewhere had to be smart enough that that little light bulb went on and they said, look, what better way? We got a bonus situation here to cover up a UFO attempt at recovery operation 30 miles away and say, yes, guess what? We think a UFO crashed and have everybody and all the cameras pointed at the impact site. However, it still is hard to fathom. And as much as I dislike the story and still dislike the story, I had to make sense of it and I certainly had to make it known. The UFO flap that stunned Nova Scotians in October 1967 was not the first such incident in Canada. The story that wouldn't go away has its roots in an event that occurred over Ottawa in 1954, 13 years earlier. Worried that our skies were under siege from an unknown threat, the Department of National Defense, in cooperation with the Department of Transport, established the world's first UFO detection station in Shirley's Bay, 10 miles west of the nation's capital. The government would have preferred to keep the whole thing quiet. They were almost successful. Wilbert Brockhouse Smith, an engineer with the Department of Transportation, was the man in charge of this project. It was his brainchild. Smith believed if he could find a flying saucer, he could duplicate its technology. Smith had really put his finger on things. He was a scientist. He was somebody who looked for facts, for data, for solid information on which to base whatever his conclusions were. The people with a serious interest in flying saucers thought well of Smith. Smith suspected that flying saucers worked on magnetic principles, geomagnetics. He hoped to confirm his theories if only he could speak to the right people, the people who knew about the disks. Smith, uh, in addition to being involved with the Department of Transport, had strong connections with the Canadian Department of National Defense, uh, most specifically the Defense Research Board, the DRB. 
In charge of the DRB was a fellow by the name of Dr. Oman Solant. He was the chairman of the Defense Research Board. Solant was a good friend of Dr. Vannevar Bush, a uh, prominent scientist in the United States, and one of the individuals who was allegedly in charge of a group of scientists looking at a crashed disk. Dr. Sarbacher enters the picture because he worked for the American Defense Research Board, the equivalent of ours. Sarbacher's work was in, in uh, guided missiles, missile propulsion. And it's, it's as if everybody was in a community that, in a position to know each, know each other or know of each other's work. Smith got his wish, and the resulting handwritten notes from his meeting with Sarbacher became the basis of Project Magnet. Smith, then the saucers do exist. Sarbacher, yes, they exist. Do they operate as Scully suggested on magnetic principles? We have not been able to duplicate their performance. Do they come from other planets? Sarbacher, all we know is um, we didn't make them, and it's pretty certain they didn't originate on this Earth. If I understand the whole subject of saucers is classified, yes, it is classified two points higher even than the H-bomb, and in fact, it is the most highly classified subject in the United States government at the present time. A key thing for me was number three, that their modus operandi, how they work, is as yet unknown, but there's a small group working under Dr. Vannevar Bush, and uh, he was a very important figure in the United States uh, in technology development like the Manhattan Project and proximity fuse and radar and, and so forth. Top dog, no question. The Canadian government encouraged Smith in Project Magnet, but on a Canadian budget. They gave him a little building, a little shack uh, in Shirley's Bay. And he equipped it with equipment that he borrowed from his own department, from the University of Toronto uh, and the Defense Research Board. Uh, there was equipment in there for measuring electromagnetic energy disturbances, for measuring uh, gamma ray, uh, x-ray type atomic disturbances. Uh, and the idea was he would have all of this set up and run it 24 hours a day in the hopes that uh, if a UFO came by, it might be detected by one or two of these instruments. On August 3, 1954, a large magnetic disturbance overhead tripped the detection station's alarm bells. Smith dashed out to look, but low clouds hid the target from his view. Smith declared that whatever flew over Ottawa that day had a greater magnetic profile than any aircraft seen before. Smith was so excited by his achievement, he wrote a press release that was immediately picked up on wire services and transmitted around the world. His superiors found themselves in an awkward position. They met with Smith and told him what he had to do. And Smith ended up uh, shutting down the, uh, the station. At that time especially, maybe not as bad now, but at that time, talk of flying saucers was not taken in a very positive light. You know, you were nuts. <laughs> and here you have a Department of Transport, <laughs> a public uh, group uh, with, a, with a flying saucer research station attached to it. So his people were quite uh, upset with all of this. Again, we have the noisy negativists saying, one guy said, oh, he was dem demonstrably crazy. He said that on a television program. And of course, I had to jump in and say, you know, that, that's Tommy Rod, that's, that's just total nonsense. He did die of a brain tumor, okay. I'm not gonna blame him for that, you know. So I think Wilbur Smith deserves our approval, our applause for all the effort he put into to the whole UFO question and his willingness to dig deeply into what was considered, you know, crazy stuff by some people. But by talking to the press, had Smith compromised the secrets of MJ-12? an American saucer retrieval program that is revealed in these documents. Those documents are the most important government documents, classified documents ever leaked to the public. 
Because in summary, they establish, if they're genuine, which I believe they are, based on detailed, careful scientific investigation, that A, flying saucers are real, <laughs> that the United States government has recovered a flying saucer and alien bodies, that it set up an outstanding group of people to deal with it, and that aliens aren't infallible when it crashed. <laughs> If the Americans did salvage a flying saucer at Roswell back in 1947, is it possible that a UFO was recovered in Shag Harbor? I was hoping to avoid all the controversy that had surrounded uh, other known UFO crash scenarios such as in Roswell. And to be honest, initially, I largely ignored it. I wasn't impressed by it whatsoever. Impressed or not, it was a story that would not go away. What I was being told by the former military uh, staff that were involved in the search effort was that while a search was going on in the Sound at Shag Harbor, military personnel already knew that the object was no longer there on the seabed, that it had moved away under the water, rounded Cape Sable Island, had gone up the coast and come to rest on the seabed off the uh, coast of Government Point which was the location of CFS Shelburne, Canada's most secret military base. Canadian Forces Base Shelburne was a joint Canadian-American military base, shut down after the thawing of the Cold War. Over the years, a cover story had been put out to uh, explain this base away as being an oceanographical uh, study base to study wave action, uh, the depth of water, salinity of water, whatever, supposedly to aid the navies of both our countries in uh, better understanding the ocean. And it wasn't until really in the 80s that it really became known as for what it really was, which was a secret submarine uh, detection base, uh, detecting submarines all over uh, the North Atlantic. The operation was part of the SUSO system, an underwater network of microphones deployed throughout the North Atlantic. The signals were channeled ashore to CFS Shelburne at Government Point, where they were monitored 24 hours a day. In addition to that, they had another uh, uh, grid laid out under the water, which was called the MAD grid, or Magnetic Anomaly Detection Grid, which could detect uh, the hull signatures of uh, heavy metal vessels, submarines in particular, and they could uh, pinpoint them on a, on a grid as to where these particular vessels were when they were picked up. But why would the UFO travel to Government Point? You have to understand that Shelbourne is part of a system for monitoring the Atlantic Ocean for the Soviet fleet, but more importantly for Soviet submarines. And so you're always concerned about any coming, anybody, anything coming within view of your sensing systems. And you want to know how vulnerable you are, because maybe this is something before an attack. First thing you do is knock out the other guy's detection system. So what I'm saying is there's a part of a much larger picture here. It's nice to talk about saucers landing on the White House lawn, you know, but in the real world, there are all kinds of electronic barriers, fences, call them what you want, detection systems. And it, I would be astonished if alien visitors didn't pay attention to these, for their own self-interest, if nothing else. The sophisticated equipment that CFS uh, Shelburne held told them this thing was simply a few miles off the coast, resting on the seabed. I was told that a flotilla of ships was quickly assembled over the resting object. In addition to the naval activity on the water, Air Force Neptunes from Summerside, Prince Edward Island, flew grid patterns over the area using hydrophones and radar to search for other objects. Meanwhile, Navy divers dove on the primary target. What the divers told me simply was that uh, there was an operation at the mouth of Shelburne Harbor 
and they held station on ships and dove over a period of one week over what was an apparent UFO on the bottom, and that it was uh, being assisted by a second craft that was somehow lending assistance to it. One of the expressions they used was that there was still activity going on down there. These men claimed to have been in the water and watched us at a fairly close range as they were placing cameras and sensors, etc. Uh, it's an incredible tale. Not only did they see objects down there, but they saw things as well. And we sort of have to leave that in your, to your own imagination as to what these things were. They're certain, or at least this particular diver is certain that they were, weren't from here. He was definitely uh, afraid to go any further than that because of the fact that he was with the military, from what we understand, was not allowed to talk about them. Not only does he say that, but we've had evidence of other military personnel involved in this operation who say the same thing, that they're not allowed to talk about it on camera. They don't want their names mentioned for fear of re some reprisals. Whatever that may be, we don't know. Other military personnel that were at this operation in a support role have suggested that there was a great deal of tension in the operation between American and Canadian personnel. At one point, one of the officers felt it necessary to intervene at one of these discussions that was spilling out around the mess, and uh, he tried to contain it and tell the diver to keep the comments down and that, you know, they shouldn't be talking about the operation over the Russian sub. And to which the diver responded saying, I don't know what that goddamn thing is down there, but it's no submarine. It isn't anything from this planet. And like, you can say whatever you want, but uh, we know what we're seeing. But what evidence is there to support the events off Government Point? Does this recently uncovered X-File lend credibility to the divers' claims? And what happened to the UFOs? Until recently, the tale of the Shag Harbor UFO's journey to Government Point where it was detected and observed by the military has remained a secret. In 1993, this top secret RCMP X-File was accidentally discovered in a Nova Scotia University archive. There's an RCMP X-File that does make mention of a second search effort off Shelburne. Again, when we go to the flap that was unfolding over Nova Scotia, there is mention by a fisherman who made an official report to the RCMP detachment. His second last sentence of the statement is very telling in that it says, perhaps it is like the thing they were looking for down off Barrington Passage or Shag Harbor or off Shelburne. This seems to give some indication that there was indeed a second and simultaneous search effort. And one week later, our former 12-mile limit was violated by a Soviet submarine that was approaching this thing. The ships broke station, sailed toward the approaching submarine to show challenge. At this point, the UFOs on the bottom become active, move under the water back down to the Gulf of Maine, break the surface and fly away. To date, the military has not released any documentation that would lend credence to a retrieval operation at Shelburne. But that doesn't deter Chris and Don in their investigation. I don't know who would have been in charge and overseen such an extensive operation off the coast of Shelburne, but I do know from discussing it with DND staff in Ottawa that they deny having any role in it. I've often wondered whether now anything could be found off of Government Point. I seriously doubt it. If this thing, as the story goes, was as big an operation as we believe it was, I can't imagine them leaving anything on the bottom for anybody else to find. Chris and Don still believe that Shag Harbor will someday offer up her secrets. Hard to believe this was a top secret military base at one time. Yeah, looking at it today, I can't really picture it as being the coordination center of anything, but I suppose back during the Cold War, it was probably pretty spick and span back when Old Glory flew over there beside our own flag there. You gotta wonder whether uh, maybe it was kept this way on purpose and make it look banal, you know, uh, not draw attention. 
you know, to throw off uh, what the true purpose of the base was. And as part of the small but determined band of UFO investigators worldwide, they continue to search for the truth behind the lights. And if you're asking me what, what does Shag Harbor have to offer, I believe in the end ultimately a greater understanding of the UFO phenomena. If we can truly take the case to another level and tie down those things we missed, whether it's the one big thing or the one little thing we've missed, we'll know better what's really going on in the skies. Are these things penetrating our skies and defense system? Probably, you betcha. Can this case shed light on it? Sure. Is it the best case? Maybe, maybe not. The best one is the one that hasn't happened yet. The, the best one is the one where we walk in and we have a piece of physical evidence that is undisputably of extraterrestrial origin, and I can throw it on the stage and it hits with a claim. That's when I'll be happy.